chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 8 to 14. I titled this message, Now What? Now What? Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in their fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Good news, great joy, all people. Good news, great joy, all people. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And we'll stop right there. Well, the Lord is good, isn't he? The Lord is good. And I want to talk about the what. Now what? The what of Christmas. The what being a problem, a test, a trial, a challenge, a difficulty. And one thing I've learned is everybody has a what in their life. Everybody does, right? Everybody here today has some type of what. And we're going to talk about finding peace and joy with a proper perspective when you have a what in your life and you don't understand why. Such as in this Christmas story, Mary certainly had a what. She's pregnant outside of wedlock and her husband or her husband that's betrothed to her, her husband to be Joseph is trying to and uh, the engagement to put her away to divorce her. Uh, back then, engagement was actually a legal document. And to end an engagement, it actually was a divorce. Joseph had a what? The woman that he loved, that he thought was honorable and chaste and loyal. She's now pregnant and she's not telling him who the father is. Remember, an angel had to tell Joseph. So that's a big what. You know, the love of his life is now pregnant. He knows it's not him. And so he's seeing the end of that relationship. The wise men had a what in the Christmas story as they were threatened by King Herod and had to escape with their life. The government imposed a brand new tax on everybody. So the citizens had this great big what, right? Mary gave birth in a stable and Joseph and Mary, being warned by God in a dream, had to flee to Egypt to save their lives. Now, there's a lot of trial, a lot of tests, a lot of problems in the classic biblical Christmas story. Do you have a what this Christmas? I learned this, that Christmas magnifies joy, magnifies the sense of family, magnifies a sense of peace. But it can also, the Christmas season, magnify the what in your life, the problem. It can magnify the sorrow, the loneliness. Do you have a what this Christmas season, such as perhaps you have a physical illness that you're dealing with, or a loved one is dealing with a physical illness, and it's a challenge, it's a heaviness in your life. Maybe your what this Christmas is financial loss. Maybe you recently lost your job, or you've had to file for bankruptcy, we have trouble paying your bills or maybe during the Christmas season, since you don't make that much money, you couldn't buy the presents that you wanted and you sense that pressure and that sadness because of that. Maybe you want this Christmas as a family conflict, maybe a separation from your husband or wife, maybe a divorce. Maybe the family conflict is with you and your children. Maybe you have a son that's estranged from you. Maybe your what this Christmas is personal loneliness. You feel alone. You've lost your spouse. Your children are far away. You just feel alone. 45% of Americans dread the holiday season. 45% of Americans dread the holiday season. And Gallup just recently came out with this poll saying that 80% of Americans are under stress. 80%. Well, that's pretty much all of us here today. They say that Christmas triggers excessive self-reflection, which leads to self-pity. Excessive self-reflection, which leads to self-pity. Christmas triggers a victim mentality about the inadequacies of life. I wish I had more. I wish I could do more. Uh, excessive self-reflection. I'm lonely, or I'm sad, or I'm bitter, or I'm upset. 
And of course, this can produce attitudes in our heart that are just very, very challenging. But here in the Christmas story, the Bible promises good news of great joy to all people in Luke chapter 2, verse 10. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news. Good news. And so I'm going to talk about good news today and how to have a joyful perspective this Christmas season, even though you have a what in your life. You can have a joyful perspective. Do you believe that? Because Christ has come. You can actually look and see the hand of God, the promises of God, the presence of the Lord, the goodness of God, the, the belief that if you trust the Lord, everything is going to turn out for good. You have a what and you don't understand why. Let's start right there. You have a what and you don't understand why. You know, a great, great friend of mine uh, back in uh, 2004, New Year's Eve, 2005, I still remember it. Uh, I was awakened on January 1st at a seven o'clock in the morning. The phone rang, I answered it, and it was uh, Cheryl Johnston, my best friend's wife. And they had done a 5K run. It was a midnight run, a 5K run that night uh, down in Dayton, Ohio, and uh, Steve was a little overweight, and uh, you know he collapsed in the run. His wife was running with him, and she had gone ahead. She was a quicker runner, and, and he said, I'll see you at the finish line. Well, the lady you know that the finish line was heaven. I'll see you at the finish line. Well, she crosses the finish line, and she's waiting, 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 and he's not coming. He's not coming. She's starting to get a little worried, and all of a sudden, she hears Cheryl Johnston over the loudspeaker. Can you please report to the information table. So she goes there and she basically says, your husband collapsed, he's being rushed to the hospital. She gets in the car and she rushes to the hospital and sure enough, he had a massive heart attack and was dead. I remember that call on January 1st, seven o'clock in the morning. I just answered in and I said, hello. And she just said, he's dead, he's gone. Steve's gone, still remember that. And uh, before that happened, you know, his what in his life was this, as uh, he had faithfully served in his church and the church, the pastor of the church uh, began to downsize and he got caught up in the downsizing of staff in his church. And uh, he'd come up a year or two earlier for Thanksgiving, to celebrate Thanksgiving with my wife and I. And I remember we have a ping pong table in our basement. And uh, he said, Tim, you want to go downstairs and, uh, and play some ping pong? I said, sure. So we went downstairs and we were just playing ping pong. And he said, I got something to tell you. And I said, well, what is it? He says, I'm being released from my job. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm being released from ministry at my church. I said, really? He says, yes, and he, I could tell he was troubled, but he's trying to rally himself. And uh, uh, sure enough, he did get released from his job, and uh, he tried everything to find ministry. And he sent out resumes everywhere, and uh, he's always talking to me, and uh, I'm trying to find opportunities for him. And a couple came up, and it didn't work out. And finally, he, he can't find a ministry job, and so he ends up going into uh, pharmaceutical sales. And the whole time he's saying, you know, I did not leave the ministry. The ministry left me. I did not leave the ministry. The ministry left me. And uh, he didn't really want to be in pharmaceutical sales. He felt a call of God in his life. And many of you know Steve Johnson. He was a very gifted teacher, one of my great friends. And uh, just under great, great stress, but he didn't understand why. Why ministry is no longer his full-time occupation? Why he got released from ministry? Why the Lord didn't open up a door? Why is he in pharmaceutical sales? Why has this happened to him? He'd always talk to me about the why. He had this big what, he's out of the ministry, but he did not understand why. Well, that happens. Maybe you're going through a what, and you don't understand why. My wife and I still talk about him passing away and, you know, why did the Lord take him? What was God's plan for that? Uh, we still miss Steve Johnston. Everybody has a what. This is what it says in 1 Peter chapter 4. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. 
But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as a faithful creator. Three quick things out of this. Expect fiery trials. Rejoice in those fiery trials because God is at work in them. And when you're going through a fire trial, commit your soul to God. Expect it. Learn to rejoice because God's working out a purpose and commit your soul to God. Sometimes people commit themselves to all the wrong things. I'm going to commit to finding out the reasons why. I'm going to commit to just throwing myself into my work and my family. Commit your soul to God. When you're going through a what and you don't understand why, commit your soul to God. The Bible says that he is faithful to you. He will be faithful to you. Listen to this. God always has a why behind the what in your life. As a Christian, we do not believe in random acts. We do not believe in, oh, it's just fate. That's just my luck. What's the chance that that would happen to me? We as Christians do not believe in fate, chance, bad luck, but rather we believe in God's providence, his loving care, his sovereignty, that God's in control, that he has a plan, that even though it's messy and we don't understand why, God's at work and he's doing a work and it's all going to turn out good. That's what we believe. Listen to this passage of Scripture. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. The why is God's divine purpose, his eternal plan, his loving providence. God always has a why behind the what that's in your life. His purpose is in the all things of your life. We know that all things, good and bad, challenging difficulties, blessings, we know that all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. His purpose is in the all things of your life. Reading from Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, the Lord our God has secrets known to no one. We are not accountable for them. But we and our children are accountable forever for all that he has revealed to us so that we may be able to obey all the terms of his instruction. So all that he has revealed to us is really the, the scriptures, the will of God written down for us. But the Bible says, the Lord our God has secrets known to no one. Sometimes the why is a secret. Sometimes the why behind your what is a secret and remains a secret in this life. What are you saying? I might never fully, completely understand the why behind my what? That's exactly what I'm saying. According to Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, the Lord our God has secrets known to no one, and we are not accountable for them. By listening for looking at Daniel chapter 2, verse 22, it says this. He reveals deep and mysterious things and knows what lies hidden in darkness, though he is surrounded by light. You know what that means? Sometimes God will reveal the why, the purpose behind it. God loves to uncover, to reveal, to show us. And so God's purpose is in your all things. Sometimes he will explain to you, show you the why behind it. And sometimes God will not show you the why behind it. Everybody has a what in their life and you're trying to understand the why. But listen to this. You don't have to understand the why to trust God. That's deep. You don't, under, you don't have to understand the why to trust God in your what Proverbs chapter 3 says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. That means there's times when you don't have your own understanding, 
but you can trust God. Trust God even though you don't understand. Lord, I don't get this. I don't understand. You could have answered this prayer. You could have intervened. I'm not sure why you're not doing this. I don't even understand the master plan here, but Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to doubt you. I'm going to trust you. The devil loves to tell you that God does not care, that God does not see, and that God can't do anything about it. Those are three lies from the enemy. And I'm here to tell you that to lie number one, God does care for you. Am I right about that? And God does love you. And God does have the power to do something about it. And that God's good work is moving forward. You don't have to understand the why to trust God in your what. Somebody say amen to that. One day you will stand in the full light of eternity and view the big picture. We're talking about heaven. You'll see God's purpose behind the path he specifically chose for you. There is a one day coming. Mary and Joseph could one day look back and see God's marvelous plan of the virgin birth and the flight to Egypt and all that took place in the Christmas story. Yes, they understood this as they looked back. Talking about God's plan, God's plan will always involve you, but it is bigger than you. See, the thing about Mary and Joseph She's pregnant outside of marriage. He's engaged to her. What was she unfaithful to me? I think I'll put her away. Such issues, such problems, such challenges. Was it about Mary and Joseph? In a small, small way. It was God's plan for Jesus to be born of a virgin that he might be the savior of the world and to die on the cross for you and I because he was born without sin and lived a sinless life and could lay down his life and the Lord laid on him the sins of the world and now we have forgiveness. I want you to know that God's plan involved Mary and Joseph and the what in their life and they didn't quite understand all the why at the time, but God's plan was so much bigger than Mary and Joseph, it included you and I some 2,000 years later. Somebody say amen to that. And when you have a what in your life and you don't understand why and you think it's all about you, it's not all about you. God is at work and God is moving. It might be about that spouse. It might be about your children. It might be about your grandchildren. It might be about something that you don't even see or comprehend, but it's going to be bigger than you. It's going to bring glory to God. And for all eternity, if you submit to his plan, you will share in God's eternal glory. Somebody say yes and amen. Ask yourself, now what? I got this what. I don't understand the why, but I'm going to trust God even though I don't understand the why. Now what? Now what? What do I mean by that question, now what? Well, ask God, what do you want to show me? What do you want to do in me? That's something we can ask today, isn't it? I have a why, a what in my life. I don't understand why. Okay, Lord, what do you want to show me? What do you want to do in me? That's kind of what Mary, her attitude when the angel came and said she would be a virgin, would conceive by the Holy Ghost, and be it unto me according to your word, O Lord. She submitted, she yielded. Lord, you may do this work in me. What do you want to do in me? What do you want to show me? In your challenge this Christmas season, if we could pray, now what, Lord? Now what? Are you willing to pray that? Lord, what do you want to show me to do? What do you want to do in me? I believe God wants to do something in you and in me this Christmas season. I think there's things he wants to show us. Maybe the next step to take. Maybe a portion of his plan, the why. I'm not sure. But I guarantee you, God's at work. 
His plan is big. It's bigger than just you. And if you could take your challenges and your struggles and say, now what, Lord? What do you want to do in me? What do you want to show me? I'm open, Lord, to your plan. And pray this or say this. So what? So what? Now what? So what do I mean by so what? So what? Some things really don't matter. And you can say so what to them. What do I mean by that? Well, dirty diapers. A flat tire. I mean, we all have a what in our life and we don't understand why, but trust me, dirty diapers don't rise to that. Now what? Why, Lord? Why the dirty diaper? Well, you know, it's three months old. That's what babies do. I mean, there's no real... Why? So what? Some things are not a big deal. Like you're at the restaurant and the waitress is a little slow taking your order. I think that's a big deal, but really it's not. (laughs) Some things are not a big deal for all you Michigan fans, whether or not your team will ever win again. It's really not a big deal. Who cares if they keep losing to their rivals? It's really not a big deal. (laughs) Merry Christmas. I literally had this down. Will your what matter in one year, five years, 20 years? I heard one preacher say, if it's going to be funny in 20 years, when you look back at it, it's really funny right now. I remember hearing about that and, you know, that helped me put some things in perspective. You know, you're getting upset about something and it seems to be a big deal and you might be angry or or frustrated with it. But if you just say, you know what, in five years from now, if I tell this story, you know, when I'm through all that, I tell this story, you know, I'm going to get a great big laugh at this. Well, start laughing now. Why is it important to say, so what? When you recognize what doesn't matter, you can focus on what does matter. Because some things do matter. Some things are a big deal. Such as eternity, your salvation, your service to God, your giving, your attitude, your core values, your relationship with Jesus Christ, these things really do matter. Slow service, the flat tire, the dirty diaper, whether or not the Lions win today and make the playoffs, those things really don't matter in the grand scheme of things. Sometimes we get upset at the little things, right? The Pharisees did this. They strained at gnats and swallowed camels. They made big deal out of little deals. The Bible condemned them for such a thing as that. What does matter today? Well, Christmas Eve, what does matter today? How about this? Jesus matters. He matters today. Your relationship with God matters. Let me put one other thing. Your family matters matters that matters your relationship with your family your relationship with God those are two things that really do matter and if you have a what in your life and you don't understand why and it is a big deal because a lot of our what's in our life are a big deal it is a big deal I want to encourage you to trust God even when you don't understand the why You know what the Bible calls that? Great faith. Great faith. When you can trust him in the darkness, when you can worship him with your tears, when you can trust him when you don't understand the why, great 
faith. That's what that is. I believe that we have people with great faith here in the house. Maybe you say, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. He'll help you. He'll help you. I believe that. Trust God today. What really does matter? Well, your family matters. May the Lord bless you and your family today. May peace be in your home. May love be in your hearts. May your marriage, may your marriage be reconciled. May your children that are estranged be brought back to family. Can you say amen to that?